Hi, my name is Richard Paxman. I'm the CEO of Paxman AB. We are a uh, publicly listed company on the first North NASDAQ uh, small cap market in Sweden. And today I'm here to talk to you about our company, Paxman Scalp Cooling. I'm going to share a few slides with you to go over a little bit about the company and an update and also talk a little bit about our last year's results and our quarter one results as well. So let me share my screen. Okay, so a little bit about um, Paxman Scalp Cooling. So for those of you who have not been introduced to us before, uh, we have a product that's used to prevent chemotherapy-induced alopecia. So chemotherapy-induced alopecia, or hair loss, as, as many of us talk about, is still a problem that exists widely around the world. Um, we know it's one of the most distressing and feared side effects in many of our patient population. In fact, we see that it's consistently ranked number one, two, or three with patients in terms of their concerns with cancer treatment. Um, we have developed a device, in fact, over 20 years ago after my mum had cancer, um, that is used to prevent or reduce chemotherapy-induced alopecia in about 50 to 60% of patients, depending on the drug regime. Um, just as a bit of a, a background, we um, use cooling devices which pump a liquid coolant around a soft single patient use cooling cap or reusable cooling cap that a patient will wear for 30 minutes before chemotherapy infusion, so at the cancer center, throughout the alopecia causing chemotherapy, and generally for 90 minutes afterwards. And this works really by cooling the scalp to around 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens is we induce vasoconstriction, so we restrict the amount of blood flow and chemotherapy to the hair follicles, so reduce drug perfusion. And we'll also see less drug diffuse through the cell membrane, both actively and passively at those temperatures. What we have seen as well is what we call a reduction in metabolic rate, reduced metabolism means reduced cell division, and therefore less uptake of that chemotherapy. So all these mechanisms really support the protection of that hair follicle. And as I said before, it works in around 50 to 60% of patients. Um, if you look at our clinical data, we've got about 8,000 study subjects now across the world with large randomized control studies, um, large real world evidence um, registries, and registries. What's really great is we, we really have an inclusive approach to our clinical data. So looking at different ethnicities, different hair types, men, women, different tumor types and different chemotherapy types. We're very committed to our ongoing research program, which I'll touch on um, shortly, looking at improving what, what, what we do from a, a, a hair loss perspective. Um, and also we have a number of clinical trials open uh, throughout there. So constantly investing and doing more to improve what we do and understand more about what we do as well. So onto the company a little bit as well. So here we've got a, a little bit of an idea of, of our team. Um, incredibly impressed with our organization. We've seen some significant growth in headcount over the years. We're still a small company, but from 2000 and uh, 17 to dit today, uh, inclusive of our, our Canadian entity, which is not actually listed on here, we've got about 90 employees. Um, very strong senior leadership team, which drives the business uh, from the United Kingdom, including our, our VP in the US and soon to be our GM uh, in Canada. And then now a much stronger middle management team. So we've taken a lot of time to invest in getting the right people in our organization with a mindset to really grow uh, and deliver on, on our investments over the coming, the coming years. We don't expect to see large numbers of increases in headcounts over the next couple of years. We've really built that good, strong uh, infrastructure. Now it's about gaining efficiencies and really taking the business to that next level. I'm very passionate about this slide. It's about, um, our, our people and our engagement. And, and this is something I'm very serious about in, in ensuring we continue um, throughout uh, the year and, and beyond, of course. So we're just seeing about 92% of, of uh, employees completed this survey, but we're seeing really, really strong engagement. Um, really people are invested in the company and, and agree and support our vision. And in, in other words, are really committed to what we do. Um, I think we treat the people right in our organization and, and, and they are 
ultimately what is driving this growth and our exciting future. So looking a little bit at the financials, so going back to 2022, um, if you look at um, our 2021 sales, we saw about 96 um, million sec uh, by the year end, um, really with about 50% from our, our US business and then rest of world business delivering another 50%. What we saw is about 50% growth in 2022. So really, really significant and really proud of that achievement, uh, delivering 145 million sec by the end of the year. Again, around 50% of the US business to driving that growth. And then you're seeing other growth within other markets. Um, our focus is to continue to, of course, deliver that impressive growth, uh, but also and I'll talk about this, improve our recurring revenues, but start to see Asia becoming a more popular and, and larger piece of our, our growth story. Um, just looking a bit at our, um, our cash flow and EBITDA, I think it's important to understand that we've been delivering now consistent um, EBITDA quarter on quarter, and I've maintained that into quarter one, 2023. Um, cash flow, we have a focus this year on delivering positive cash flow by the end of the year. We'll talk a bit about the investments that we've made over the years, but our commitment at the end of 2021 and beginning of 2022 was really to drive that growth, invest in some key areas in the business. So you'll see there's been a heavy outflow of cash investing in those areas um, up until really the end of Q1 2023 with now a focus on driving that positive cash flow and that consistent positive EBITDA as well. And we're very confident we can achieve that. This just looks at some of the figures. Again, I can't go into all of these today, but um, delivering that consistent revenue growth as demonstrated and maintaining some positive margins with a hope to improve those going forward from a gross margin, gross profit perspective. And um, what we did see is, although we saw, of course, increases in our external and personnel costs, we're actually now starting to see those really stabilize. And we've consistently shown a stabilization in costs, which ultimately will help drive that positive EBITDA and ultimately longer term overall net profit. Important to understand, based on the business models that we operate, we do have um, high levels of depreciation running through the business. And that's a result of those strong investments that we've made into the United States, that capital equipment installation. Um, and that's where ultimately we install scalp coolers into the marketplace and then generate the revenues from those scalp coolers. Looking at Q1 then. So um, as I explained very briefly earlier on, we've now incorporated in Paxman Canada. Paxman Canada so will operate a little bit like the US company, in a sense that it will generate recurring revenue streams, uh, but we actually have our own people deployed in Paxman Canada. And there will be a slightly hybrid approach where ultimately we will deliver uh, and install capital equipment in some scenarios in more smaller regional centers but drive that recurring revenue stream at some of the larger cancer centers where we offer a full service um, provision. So we've got Paxman AB, that's the small public entity in, in Canada. We've got Paxman Group Limited, which is our, our group company in the United Kingdom, which ultimately then has the subsidiaries. Paxman Coolers Limited manufactures, distributes, does all the regulatory marketing, et cetera. So that's the, that's the core business from a, a functionality and operations perspective. Paxman US Inc, our fastest growing part of the business and, and where we see most of recurring revenues. And as I said, Paxman Canada. This just looks at the last year and then um, our first quarter. So we saw some revenue growths in the first quarter, uh, which is good. Um, what we also saw again is, is, is as a whole stabilization of costs, some increases um, in some areas, but um, as expected, nothing, nothing to be concerned about. And over the period, we will see them being stable. And in fact, in some areas, we'll see some cost reductions. Um, that positive EBITDA, lower than Q4, but if you remember Q4, um, the, re the restatement of um, Forex gains uh, was played a key part in that drop in external costs, if you can see. So overinflated ultimately the, um, the, the figures uh, but then reduced uh, the 
or increase the loss at the end of the year. So really happy with Q1. As I said, stabilization of costs, strong sales growth again, and hopefully we can continue to deliver that for the remainder of the year. Just looking at where our sales came from, um, really a, a, a real mix across the world. The UK being very strong market for us, the US continues to be strong, of course. Japan and Italy and, and India also showing some, some strong delivery, um, some strong um, opportunities. Um, and that was very much our plan in terms of our, our, our capital raises. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, and that was a real focus on globalization. Lots more to do, um, but happy and, and comfortable with, with the growth that we're seeing there. Here in um, is, is our, a graph looking at patient income. Uh, patient income really is, is the KPI relating to our, our US business. We see this ongoing improved trend, um, average daily treatment revenue, we call it, Increase, increases on a on a on a per day basis and we are really driving utilization at the moment a slight switch in our approach for the remainder of the year so installing at less new sites installing less equipment and really focusing on transition from the self-pay model to our buy and build model which we can talk about more later uh, but actually um really improving utilization across all of our sites uh to get the best return on investment and reduce some of that capital outlay as well that we've seen over the last few years. Recurring revenue is something that I'm very passionate about, that you've seen consistent growth in recurring revenue over the years, um, albeit slight drop in overall percentage of sales based on the fact that we've seen increases in our capital sales across other parts of the world. Uh, but our, our three, four markets include Mexico, Japan, US and Canada. Longer term, the plan is to improve recurring revenues, and we we hope to do that through um, really our new product development and changes in business models where we can, uh, implementing topical products to go with scalp cooling, uh, consumable caps to support that as well uh, in cheap in, in markets where we can drive costs down to a certain extent. So um, we are committed to improving our recurring revenues. Uh, over the coming of the coming years i talked a little bit about the raises again for those of you that know the company already um we've done a couple of large raises uh for the size of the company over over the last couple of years um, very much focused on internationalization um implementation of our buy and bill model further work in the reimbursement area and some high level of spend in the area of chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, which I'll touch on very shortly. Um, I'm very confident that we've delivered on these investments and we're starting to see a return on these investments. Um, I think it's important to understand that the large expense so far has been um, implemented, so especially in the CIPN space. And now we can really start to see the benefits that we've um, derived from those investments. So a strong ROI expected over the coming years. This just gives you a breakdown of where we've spent the money, whether it be research and development, whether it be part of our internationalization plan and oversized employees, the Canadian expense, et cetera. Uh, but the biggest spend really being on that capital deployment into the United States, as well as the development work that we've done in the area of chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Now, buy and build has been incredibly important for us. It's critical to our business in terms of improving utilization. One of the biggest barriers in the United States relating to um, the use of our device is the cost. Ultimately, um, each patient, as of today, in reality, is paying out of pocket up to $2,000 per, per patient. Now, that's okay if you're a wealthy patient or you're getting support in other ways, but actually the majority of Americans, you know, with all already high out-of-pocket expenses associated means that's a difficult choice to take. So we must work hard to remove that. We've been working with the payers, the, the public and commercial payers. We've been working with the American Medical Association. We've been working with the guidelines to change that landscape and ultimately move towards a situation where the patients are receiving these um 
re receiving these treatments as standard of care and included in their insurance plans. And that's meant we've had to shift our business model. Uh, in June 2022, we started to shift and move our current customer base to this new business model, which we call the buy and build model, where ultimately we still install the equipment free of charge. But as of now, we sell the cooling cap to the provider and the provider then sells the cooling cap to the um, to the patient, passes the cooling cap to the patient, um, but bills the CPT codes that we've developed to the insurer. So ultimately, the, now the provider should be able to cover the cost of providing the treatment, including the supplies, and potentially uh, begin to make a profit where possible or make a contribution towards cost, which is more appropriate. Um, as of um, the end of this quarter, we will have contracted with 45 locations on the new buy and build model, but those will not all yet be operational. So just to get a bit of an understanding in terms of the return on investment, it costs around $7,000 to install a cool, one cooling system. Um, the annual capital cost is around $2,000, so we depreciate that over a five-year period. We see an average income of $1,800 per patient in our buy and build model, and overall, uh, a contribution of $1,000 to our fixed costs. So ultimately, it takes about two patients a year to break even. Um, and beyond that, of course, drives contribution towards profit. So it's a great business model. What we need to do, though, is get the switch and also improve utilization on site. But where we are operating this new business model, we're seeing some really big improvements in utilization. And um, this shows our uh, U.S. income over a period of time, and then ultimately this smaller blue bar here is showing our direct provider income, so that buy and bill income. We have to push this forward. I think it's going to take some time to generate momentum, uh, but we're feeling more confident um, month on month when some of the larger health systems are adopting this new business model. This is really good to see. Um, where we're seeing a drive in improvement. So where we have a historically um, systems in place, we're actually seeing on average a 300% increase in, um, in utilization at these particular sites. In terms of results for providers using these hub services, so not all our customers use our benefits investigation hub services, but of the 203 patients that we've seen go through this, 163 had coverage. That's 80% of patients had coverage by their insurance for scalp cooling. And then those patients that didn't have coverage ultimately went into our patient assistance program and received free goods. Now, this is fantastic because it really makes sure that scalp cooling is accessible that's one of the biggest barriers to date. So really proud that we can do this as a company and support all patients get access to scalp cooling, not just those that can afford. These are some of the payers that are paying. So large commercial plans, as well as Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so again, key focus for us, we'll continue to push that buy and build model into the remainder of 2023. And I do still have a target of 40% of our customers will move to the new buy and build model by the end of the year. So just a final few slides looking at R&D, uh, we continue to invest in research and development. This is something I'm very, very passionate about, as well as clinical trials. We've got a topical product in development, which is now in nano formulation. Um, so hope to see some more momentum with a commercial part by, partner by the end of the year. We've also got the future of cooling caps and, and a really a recyclable, sustainable product that we hope to deliver in the future. Um, and that really should, again, back to that whole idea of developing products to allow us to enter into more of a consumable or recurring revenue stream in the future. Now, I've talked about this before in, in discussions, but CIPN really is an unmet need, and that's chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. That's another side effect of chemotherapy treatment, and we know it has been a severe, severe and dose limiting side effect. Um, symptoms of that might be tingling, pins and needles, sensation, pain, burning, numbness, sensitivity to cold or hot, and really even difficulty with doing buttons up, so um, holding small objects, etc. So um, incredibly, incredibly debilitating. It affects about 1.4 million people worldwide. It has a huge economic burden uh, to the healthcare systems, in fact, up to 17,000 dollars per patient that receives, uh, have this side effect and it can actually cause missed days at work as well so not only a really unmet need from a, a psychosocial and, 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 and a pain perspective but also 
really on the economy as well. So we must do something about it. I talk about it being dose limiting because currently the standard of care is if a patient starts to have chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy symptoms, what happens is we actually have to reduce or delay their chemotherapy. So ultimately that can have an effect on quality of life, but also survival income outcomes. Our proposed intervention means that, and it's chemo and cryocompression means that the patient can continue on chemotherapy, finish their chemotherapy, ultimately improving survival and quality of life. It's a huge market. It's as big as chemo, it's as big as our hair loss market. So in fact, possibly even in many cases considered more important. And um, so we expect really to be targeting about 1.5 million patients every single year, if not more globally in terms of how many patients are having chemotherapy. So we've developed in joint collaboration with the National University of Singapore, a cryocompression device. Um, one treats the arms, one treats the legs. And um, these are now beginning to be deployed in different parts of the world, but mainly the Singapore and the United States under a clinical trial setting. Um, in at the beginning of the year, we received wonderful news that SWOG, it's a cooperative group in the US, um, Southwestern Oncology Group, sponsored by the NCI, are actually going to carry out a large randomized study uh, looking at our device uh, with three different arms and over 700 patients. We're now rolling out these devices into these cancer centers. We had our first patient back in June, which is incredibly exciting. Um, this study once and for all will prove the benefits of um, cryocompression. Um, and we really, really are excited about the potential here. We've also got an ongoing clinical trial in Singapore. Uh, the plans are to have 80 patients um, and data so far is looking very, very promising. I think the reality is, is, is we have some way to go. Um, but we've got over the main hurdle in terms of getting a large number of devices into market, which has been a huge cost burden. Uh, the next steps will be then to how we consider commercialization. But for a time period now, the main focus is the clinical aspect of things, gathering data not only on efficacy, but usability, driving improvements in our technology, and then ultimately putting a commercial plan together going forward. Our goal is probably to commercialize in Singapore first, um, but then with uh, the United States on the radar thereafter. So lots going on, um, a great opportunity for us. Um, very happy to speak to any of you individually and uh, to really delve into those figures and, and give you a little bit more flavor. I appreciate this as a very quick and fast over view of, of the business, uh, but look forward to speaking with you all soon. Thank you very much.